Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. As we promised you last night, tonight, an all-in exclusive. See, in the post-racial world, it's Obama who sees race. Obviously, race relations in this country have come a long way. We just elected a black president, our first. And I've always made the argument uh, over several years now that America, in fact, before the election of Barack Obama, that we are in a post-racial America. It's getting tiring. We have a black president. We have black, uh, black senators. We have black... Uh, heads of captains of, of business companies. We have black entertainment channels. I, where is there racism? I don't think there's racism. You hear it all the time these days. The notion the country's election and re-election of a black president represents a final break with racial harms. That because of this one man, Barack Obama, the country's racial history has been redeemed. And we are all, all living in a new country, in a new era, untainted by all that unpleasantness from before. Well, in an epic and masterful and highly controversial essay that everyone is talking about, perhaps the greatest essayist of our time, in the cover piece for The Atlantic called The Case for Reparations, ta Coates. Ta as ta Coates writes, an America that asks what it owes its most vulnerable citizens is improved and humane. An America that looks away is ignoring not just the sins of the past, but the sins of the present and the certain sins of the future. Coates traces the long, dark history of the economic plunder and exploitation that are essential features of America's tradition of white supremacy and racial hierarchy, not just in the days of slavery or the days of Reconstruction or the lynching era of the Jim Crow South, but up in the North in the boom years after the Second World War, where government policy, private action, and even mob violence all worked to destroy black wealth. What this essay does is tell a story about debt that has been accrued, a real monetary debt, the displacement of wealth from one group of people used to fatten the pockets of another group of people. It's about America's tendency to not see an injustice as an injustice when the perpetrators get away with it for enough time. For Coates to ignore the fact that one of the oldest republics in the world was erected on a foundation of white supremacy, to pretend the problems of a dual society are the same as the problems of unregulated capitalism is to cover the sin of national plunder with the sin of national lying. And there's nothing more anathema to the current con conservative conversation on race than that inconvenient truth. And joining me now is the one and only ta Hazi Coates. Congratulations on the essay. Thank you, thank uh, you. You've been working on, you and I have been talking about this essay for two years as <laughs> yeah, you've been working about it. on the other show. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right, yes, exactly, right. Yeah. Since, I, yeah, since I was on, uh, yeah. on Up. So let's start out with, well, what is the, what's the case? What's the argument in a nutshell for people that have not read the essay? Like, what do you want people to walk away with? Well, the, the basic feature is really, really simple. Defining our relationship between black America and white America is taking, is plunder, is stealing. And this is obviously true, I mean, most explicitly in slavery, a period of 250 years. But it continues after enslavement uh, into debt, peonage, and sharecropping in the South, into uh, racial terrorism, where you're talking about the seizing of people's bodies, uh, into through some of the most progressive policy that, you know, we erected during the 20th century, uh, through our housing legislation, uh, through our GI Bill. Basically, you know, it's just a defining feature in terms of how the two communities have related in our history. Um, you, you, you tell the story in the beginning. I mean, and I think this is a really important point because I think one of the ways we think about I'll speak for myself. One way I had sort of been brought up to think about race and racism was as um, a, a problem of exclusion, of hatred, right. of people right. saying and doing mean things, of, right. of doing horrible, violent things, right. and of, of, of constraining people's freedom. Right. Right? You couldn't go to that water fountain. Right. You couldn't go to that pool. And that that was the injury. And you really put a lot of emphasis on this on the, the fact that actually, no, no, it was taking stuff. Right, like, right. Taking stuff was the core feature. Right, of right. System. Plunder, plunder. I, plunder. And you yeah. tell the story of a guy named Clyde Ross. Um, this is uh, from the video that came out with the essay. This is Clyde Ross. Take a listen. My name is Clyde Ross. I was born in uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. I bought this house in 1958. Go pay 26000 and the house was worth 12000 That means I was overcharged quite a bit. We have been cheated out of the right to be human beings in a society. We have been cheated out of buying homes at a decent price. That's, that's, that's uh, Clyde Ross. He started down in Mississippi, and you tell the story of, of the plunder, just one individual person, the plunder he experienced. Tell, tell me that story. It starts with a horse. Yeah. <laughs> well, it starts with uh, a Clyde Ross. Let me just say, one of the, I think, unfortunate things that happens when we have this discussion is that uh, there's a focus on poverty uh, as though uh, African Americans were quote unquote working class, middle class, and have things are not themselves subject to plunder. And you, you know, really see the opposite of that in the case of Clyde Ross, where they had a farm, they had mules, they had cows, they had chickens. All of it was taken uh, uh, from them. 
Um, this is back in Mississippi. This is back in Mississippi in the 1920s. And Clyde Ross grew up under a situation where basically uh, white folks in Mississippi could take when they wanted to take, uh, right down to his horse, his only possession as a child. Explain, like what? Like they just showed up one day? They literally just showed up one day and said, we want that horse. And they took his horse and they put it on the racetrack. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it got much worse than that. His brother, for instance, uh, who had epilepsy, had an epileptic fit in town. They took him and they put him in parchment prison. And anybody that knows anything about parchment prison understands that it's essentially 20th century slavery at that point in time. Never saw his brother again. Could never even recover the body. So he is raised in a world, this is in the 1920s, in, in Mississippi, with a family that has some assets in which those assets up to and including the human life of the family member right. can be at any moment seized. White people can show up and say, yoink. Right, basically. basically. That's ours. Yoink is the thesis of the story, basically. Yes, that's yoink. right, yes. That should have been our headline, That should have been the headline, <laughs> right. yoink. Right. right, because, and eventually, that is precisely the thing that, that pushes him up to the north. That's right, right. that's he, right. There's a great line in there, what, he, what he's seeking is the protection of law. The protection of law, which is the first thing he said to me, and I did not understand what he was saying. And then when he outlined, you know, what was going on in the South, uh, which is no black lawyers, no black judge, judges, no black prosecutors, no black people with any sort of stake in the legal process at all, uh, with any sort of positions of power in the state. That's no law if you're black. He comes to the North and he thinks he's going to get away with that. And, he, you know, on some level, there, there is a change. I don't want to undersell that. But he came to the North at a time when uh, home buying was effectively being subsidized by the federal government. We think that, you know, our you know, idea of home ownership, the suburbs, that this is something that, you know, is a matter of just rugged individualism. But the government engineered this, except for black people. And Clyde Ross was a part of that generation of folks who had jobs, was working a job, ended up working three jobs, and could not get a legitimate mortgage to buy. Federal them. Housing Authority made, basically made, invented redlining. Redlining being, I mean, they were literally red maps. Uh, Federal literally Housing Authority we said, we, have the we will not underwrite mortgages right. in these neighborhoods That's because right. there are black people. That's right. And then that practice then spread out into the private industry, uh, which, you know, didn't need much of a push. You know, it's more of a collusion, in fact. Uh, and themselves, you know, even without, you know, the push from the government said, you know, we will not give loans to black people. And I, I just want to, you know, push this point home. Um, that didn't just affect black people. It affected white people. If you were an individual decided maybe you didn't want to be racist and you just you know, had no problem with black people moving in, uh, you had great incentive to leave anyway um, right. because the property values in your neighborhood were going to decline. Because when black people moved in, the property values, because partly of federal housing policy, right. would right. actually decline. Right. 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 So whether you're right. racist or not, you're, right. people are moving out. Right. And so he buys on what's something called a contract sale, yes. which is just basically a straight hustle. Again, yoink. Right, yoink again. I mean, basically, it is all of the problems of renting with all of the problems of buying and none of the rewards of either. Uh, at any moment, should you miss a payment, uh, the person who holds the lease can immediately take the home from you, keep the down payment, keep all the payments that you've made up until that point. And in fact, they set it up so that that was what would actually happen. They are trying. So that, basically, this, this person comes in and does a contract sale, and I am, I am both the seller and the lender. Right, right, right. 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 And Although you're I don't working, tell you that. I don't you, tell you all that. I don't tell you that, right? <laughs> right? And you are now working your way out of debt to me. And right. if you miss a payment, I can say, you missed a payment. I'm taking all the back money you've paid me, right. even if you paid 80% down on the house, right. and the equity the house and I'm putting you out. That's exactly what happened. And this is um, serious. I'll just add this really quickly. I got a call from my mother this morning and I, I don't want to get emotional here, but um, I grew up in West Baltimore. My grandmother lived in West Baltimore. There was a home I went to uh, every day after school. My grandmother bought that home on contract. And I didn't even know that until my mother read the story and, you know, explained that to me. Um, my grandmother... <laughs> was Clyde Ross, you know, basically came right. up, raised three kids in the project, sent them uh, to college, uh, worked cleaning white folks' uh, floors, and managed to buy a home, and this is the only way she could do it. It's a very similar story. And so the accru what, what the result of the plunder, right, the argument is, is we, got, we had slavery, and you don't right. even actually linger on slavery that long. Right? No, it's no, no, not no. that big a part we of it. We can give you that. Right. I mean, exactly. like, okay. <laughs> slavery, right. You don't want to buy, right. buy the reparations for slavery argument? Okay, right. Fine. Let's right. So let's talk about plunder just in the 1950s, right? right? So, right. okay, what we have created is this wealth gap, mm -hmm. right? This, mm -hmm. and, and there's this great Chris Rock meditation on what wealth means right. on a play, right. because I think it, not, it really gets something key here. Take right. a listen. I'm not talking about rich. I'm talking about wealth, because wealth will set us free, okay? Because wealth is empowering. Wealth can uplift communities from poverty, okay? Wealth is passed down from generation to generation. You can't get rid of wealth. Rich is some you can lose with a crazy summer and a drug habit. Right? Wealth is this thing that there's a stability to it. And one of the things we see is this unbelievable gap in yeah. household wealth yeah. between white people and black people. Even, even when you normalize for income. Even right. people with 
master's degrees or law degrees. Right, you right, you right. normalize across these things. Right. We see these pers this persistent racial wealth gap. Right, and this is the thing, again, you know, just to bang on this, it, you know, um, inequality is a very big problem in, in America and in the world, right? And it's something that, you know, obviously we believe in the fight against inequality. But this is not just a matter of poverty. You know, racism is, is, is an actual real thing with actual consequences, and the wealth gap is the biggest illustration of that. Um, black graduates twice as likely to be unemployed as white college right. graduates. Right. I, mean, I saw a crazy statistic um, for all college graduates in the same age range, employment, employment was 5.6%, 12.4%. .6%, .4 right. You go through all the ways in which race, not socioeconomic status, not right. poverty, right? right? Um, well, see, Chris, I think yeah. the thing, we're, we're, we're laboring under a dangerous illusion, and this was really one of the motivating uh, features for, for this essay, and that is that if you are black in this country and you play by the rules, you go to college, you get married, uh, you know, you delay having kids, you'll be okay. You probably will be okay, but you won't be equal. It won't right. end, end inequality. That's not a solution for ending. That's good that's advice for thing. individuals. Okay. But that's not an anti-inequality. But uh, the argument uh, you get from you've gotten from Barack Obama in responding to reparations, you get right. from you get from white liberals, you get from conservatives, you get right. from some black liberals, you get from all sorts of people is basically anything like reparations is completely impracticable, A. And B, we've had all sorts of redistributive programs in this country. We had the war on poverty. We got Medicaid. We had the Great Society. We've had um, all kinds of head start. We've had all kinds of redistributive policies that have redounded disproportionately the benefit of black Americans if black people are disproportionately poor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're doing it. We're trying. We're, we're, we're redistributing. Yeah. Uh, well, first, I, you know, just, just two, two quick things. Um, the president gives the argument that I, and with all due respect to President Obama, he gives the argument that you expect President Obama to give. I don't expect President right. Obama to come on and support reparations. Uh, in terms of the impracticality argument, all I can say to this is the following. Um, in 1859, uh, Frederick Douglass was arguing for the liquidation of what? Trillions of dollars of wealth in the form of human slaves, okay? I can't think of anything that was more impractical than what Frederick Douglass was arguing for. It happened, though. And right now, if you talk to anybody, they would say Frederick Douglass had the correct and moral position. Everybody would say that that was totally the right thing to do. Um, I, I'm just not particularly swayed by that. You think, you think the moral case is compelling enough here that the whatever practical uh, aspect... I think we can do what we want to do. <laughs> That's what I think. I think if we decide a world in which we yeah, decide... So, what's that, so what does that look like, right? Well, I mean, the first step, as I outlined in, in, in the article, is support John Conyers' bill, H.R. 40, to study, to study enslavement and the effects and the legacy of enslavement and see what remedies might be possibly there should we find something wrong. Um, and a lot of people get frustrated with that. They want me to have a, you know, an outline. Yeah, yeah. Name program. a dollar figure, right, right, exactly, Hattie exactly. <laughs> but we haven't even studied it. I mean, you got to get your hands on the actual problem. Look, I did what I could. You know what I mean? I spent <laughs> two years looking at this, and I tried to do the, do, you know, to do the best that I could. But we need an actual serious study. I mean, this is a huge thing. I mean, yes. I, you know, I mean, to calculate not just enslavement, but to calculate housing discrimination, to calculate, you know, educate school, school segregation, to calculate criminal justice policy, to calculate all of that and figure out what the effect has been on African Americans and how much of that we can actually pay. I mean, this is a huge deal. This is not a small thing. Right. Um, so I did what I could. <laughs> you, you got the one, one historical moment in the essay that I did not know at all was the, the very heated uh, debate in Israel as yeah. a young nation about yeah. the reparations from Germany. Yeah. And there was this huge conflagration over it. Right. Um, and one of the things that was fascinating about it is Germany ended up paying reparations, mm -hmm. and that investment was key. Right. It was key to no, a young no. nation in its electrical grid and all right. these things, right? right? Investment and wealth, as Chris Rock said, right. wealth really does matter. Right. Ta-Nehisi Coates from The Atlantic, uh, the piece is The Case for Reparations. It's an absolute must-read. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for your help, Chris. Seriously. Yeah, you bet, thank you. Coming up, it's not often we get to say we're going to talk to someone from Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers-funded outfit, but we're going to talk to someone from Americans for Prosperity about the bargain the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan have struck and what the Koch brothers have to do with it next.